Hi there, it's Marcus here, and I want to welcome you to History 300. It's a wonderful course. Well, I'm biased because I, I think uh, the courses that I'm fortunate enough to teach are wonderful. Um, I want to welcome you here, and I also want to just talk a little bit about what you can expect from the course and from me as your, I think of as a historical tour guide, really. Um, I'm recording this on the Saturday afternoon and it's uh, the 10th of July and uh, yeah, it's a bit cold outside and windy, so I've got this on. We are on the sort of edge of a COVID sort of lockdown -y sort of thing, aren't we? And uh, that means, of course, that the delivery of the course may change a little bit, but currently, of course, we are scheduled to be meeting... Um, on what is it monday afternoon and tuesday uh, mornings uh, depending on where you're sitting i think but anyway i'm not going to worry too much about the technicalities now because i have to admit what i've been really thinking about over the day is the rollout of the course and how to sort of introduce you to it and if you don't know me most of you probably do having done history 140 and maybe history 210 when i used to teach it um yeah i uh, I'm interested in thinking about history, not just going and collecting some information, uh, which often people think is what historians do, but no, historians actually think about time, they think about places and people and cultures and civilizations and how things happen, how things change uh, and so on. And they're very much aware, a good historian is, uh, of how their own interests uh, and uh, I guess biases you might say not in the negative sense of a bias but you know how if I'm an interested if I'm interested in gender or indigenous histories or the history of capital and technology and so on how all of these things shape the way that we interpret the world but also make us sensitive or sensitize us to different ways of getting information and where do we go and look and what do we think of as important and what do we discard simply because it doesn't meet our needs as a researcher. So historians are researchers. We research across time. We research past events in order to, one, translate them into modern uh, contexts where they may be meaningful, uh, give us insight into the human condition, for instance. But we're also uh, researchers in, in the quest, I guess, for what is it that really makes people tick and how does place, context, culture and civilization shift the way we tick but you know are there i guess we could say are there deep continuities there a mother will always love their child a father will always care for their child it's a very simple statement uh, but we can see that at different times love relationship um and I guess even the morals and ethics around these sorts of things have not been the same. Yet, is there something essentially human? Because history is about the textual evidence, particularly on what it means to be human. And we can bring in, we can expand text to include things like archaeological evidence and so on as well. Uh, geological evidence, the, the way we've terraformed and shaped the world around us as, as civilizations rise and fall. But essentially, most of the evidence in history is to be found in texts and books. I'm looking around my room here and I've got books of different kinds. Um, I would hope that as budding historians that you have a really good nose for historical information and you have a great pleasure in historical narration the narratives of history i have for many years collected national geo ooh, i'm trying to break that come into here i am come no it doesn't like me uh this is a national geographic thing and uh I'm waving it around at you, but I can see on the screen that, oh, it likes this side, but it doesn't, oh, there it is. This is the National Geographic History. And it's just got stories about med medieval cathedrals, the Olympians, Egypt, Australia's last, uh, no, America's last slave ship and so on. Those sorts of things 
collecting bits of historical data, you could say, is, is useful to do. But is it the core work of historians? And I would argue that it's not, that essentially that material that I was just waving at you, and I know you can only see me in the little um, square at the top of the uh, screen, uh, that material is in actual fact the grist to the historian's mill. In other words, a historian thinks more broadly than that, and that's really what I want to talk to you about. But before I do, I just want to flag a couple of things. I think history today is very, very relevant, not only because we are at a, at a real turning point, a hinge point in history where what was taken for granted in my generation is not taken for granted in your generation, uh, especially if you're a, a millennial. Uh, you've, your, your experience of the world is very different. So historians are thinking about this and, and looking at the world around us, but we're also seeing our culture is extremely historicist. In other words, it draws on history, not only in, in the, uh, I guess, the Netflix tradition of uh, recycling history and historical narratives and, and time pieces from different periods, um, so that we get great Viking uh, parodies and, and, and so on and the imaginings of different parts of the world. China has been recycling its history to make incredibly epic movies for at least 20 to 30 years and that, that has been coupled with the Chinese ascendancy. But, you know, we've got our cultures are quite historically interested but we also invert history and project it into the future everything from star wars through to um medieval romances and so on and that sort of because star wars is a medieval romance in many respects um it is the way we use the narratives of history to also explore the future and if any of you ever go looking for my writings you'll find that i write mostly about the future and not about the past but I also want to look at the way our culture has drawn on history over time. Okay, so I'm just leaning over here. Um, Bernard Cornwell's Agincourt, a, a really cool historical novel. He's the guy that's written all those novels um, about uh, Anglo-Saxon England, uh, which Netflix, I think it is, have turned into the Last Kingdom series. But there are also other uses of history where you use myths and legends from history. So I'm just thinking of the Marvel series, actually. The Marvel series drawing on, on another book of mine, Norse myth, for instance. Um, all that sort of stuff. But this is the sort of thing that we're going to potentially be able to talk about and discuss. Right now, um, I want to move into what you can expect from this course. So it's course... This course is called Questioning History. Um, history is often mistakenly confused with a body of knowledge. Oh, I'm an, I know all about Australian history, everything from 1788 through to now, or Australian prehistory with the Indigenous uh, peoples involved there as well, or, you know, the black armband history of a certain kind of Australian history where we're looking at the impact of Western civilization upon Indigenous societies in Australia, societies being plural, of course. Um, that's the kind of, again, that's the material that historians work with. Uh, but it's, I don't want you to think that that's what historians only do. Historians ask bigger questions than that. And this course is very much about asking those questions. It says, well, how do we do history? How do we actually make historical knowledge? What does it mean to be objective? Are there historical facts and so on? A lot of this stuff, many of you may have thought about, but it's quite likely also that many of you haven't. So a historian obviously needs something to study, as I say here on this slide. Could be Australian history, women's history, 20th century history, etc. Okay, so that's that we choose our domains, and our domains will be chosen specifically, um, I guess, de determined by our own interests, our own passions, what really makes us interested in the world around us and its pasts, plural, because there's not just one past, there are multiple pasts. So I say here the practice of history involves a portfolio of skills, you know, to do with methods of research. How do we construct pervasive, persuasive arguments? How do we test our assertions? Because if we want to have a historical 
statements that claim to be truth statements, just like in science or anywhere else, we need to be able to provide a certain level of evidence and demonstrate that this is the way we can arrive at certain forms of historical conclusions. How do we test those assertions, therefore? The promotion also of values such as tolerance for ambiguity. We don't know everything. In fact, we've got to be very, very careful about making sweeping statements that this is the absolute truth. Those black and white absolutes, they don't exist or work effectively when we start working with human beings, for instance, because we're too complicated. And there, there's always that sort of grey space where you can't be too sure about what happened here or there, even about something historical that happened just last week. So these are the sorts of things that we're going to be looking at. So I want you to remember that the past no longer exists. Even yesterday is gone forever. Yet the past informs much of our cultural, okay, political, environmental, economic practices. Okay, so we are living at the growing edge, you could say, working at the growing edge of historical time. Social, cultural, socio-environmental or socio-ecological processes are all at work today, but they've been set in motion years, decades, centuries, even millennia beforehand. When I say millennia, let's take Christianity which has its roots in the Near East, uh, in, you know, the area around Mesopotamia and Egypt uh, and ancient beliefs there that go right back to the founding of, of the early cities, okay? And we are living, if we are Christian or if not, we are living in Christian cultures or societies. Australia is a Christian society. Western civilization is a Christian civilization even though we don't necessarily all practice any specific kind of Christianity any longer, the values that set up the parameters for this work are there. Okay, so the past also provides us with models for thinking about the future, and that's one of the reasons why when I talked about Star Wars and, and, and science fiction and so on, they're looking at, they're drawing on, the writers of these um, narratives are drawing on models from the past that they extrapolate into the future. Okay, so in fact, the past is the repository of all those images that we can ever have, actually, the values, the assumptions, and, and that inform our imagination. The reason why I've got a, an iPhone here, well, no, it's not an iPhone, is it? It's a, an Android. Um, the reason why I've got an Android here is because in a Newtonian universe of, clock, uh, of cogs and wheels and mechanisms, uh, a Leonardo da Vinci who could imagine the helicopter, the submarine, tanks and other, all sorts of things. He could not imagine a cell phone, a, a wireless of any kind, because, of course, everything in his world was needed to be connected physically. So the limits of imagination move slowly forward and are deeply informed by the past, and we need to be aware of that. What else? Okay, so a quick snapshot then. So this course looks at how we do history. It's not about any specific period in history. Some of that you can choose to play with yourself. But its focus is on the thinking and the practices of being a historian, okay? It's an essential introduction to the profession and also to how you will teach history because I know many of you will be in the teaching business or going into the teaching business. Okay, so in 2017, um, Peter Sextus, who's a noted historian, um, and I've used his work quite a number of times in this uh, course, and we draw on one of his books, but not in the main readings, but in, in extra readings. He notes in this particular article, history graduates are routinely expected today okay, to be able to discuss the epistemological and narrative theories that enable them to move from the archive where you do your research to authorship where you produce books like this one for instance okay so he's noting and he's writing if we look here at an educational philosophy and theory journal he's writing for an audience of history teachers 
and he's saying there's more to teaching history now than just conveying facts. We're, I'm not asking you in this particular course, and in fact, much of what Amy and Margaret and I do is not asking you to just organise a bunch of facts so that you can get them into a chronological order and tell the story straight. We're actually asking you to interpret and to think about the material that you're using. Now, as third-year students, you need to be thinking even more deeply about this. Epistemology is the study or the philosophy, you could say, of how do we make true statements? How do we make knowledge? So Sexus is saying, okay, graduates going out into the field, you need to be able to talk about how do we make knowledge, historical knowledge. And that's really what this course is all about. So we organise the course not around lectures, they are old fashioned now. Um, so for, and since I started this course, actually, it's been built around a three hour colloquium. That's where we come together, having done one or two of the readings, they're guided by some questions uh, and we discuss, we explore, we probe. Okay, so the course is a reading course, okay, for most of the weeks, there are two readings. There's no lecture, as I just said. Our workshops are set up as colloquia. Over here it says colloquia, a conference at which scholars, that's you guys, or other experts present papers on, analyze and discuss a specific topic, okay? So you won't be presenting papers necessarily, but uh, you'll be coming along having done some readings so that you can engage thoughtfully in the uh, questions that we deal with. So I'm going to pre-record something like this that will sort of give you something to think about. And yeah, I expect you, and it's part of the course prerequisites, uh, pre that you attend these workshops, you engage with the discussions, you present and defend your ideas and so on. Okay. So that's the way it's going to run. Yes. But it is a reading course. You're going to have to read. History is about reading, unfortunately. You can't explore, escape that. The course is a reading course. The readings are available. If you're seeing this, the blackboard's opened up. So you get a head start. Start looking through the readings. Download them. Collect them. Uh, set them up. Set yourself up a reading schedule, okay? It's about reading. There's no escape, I'm afraid, <laughs> okay? This course is delivered in the shadow of COVID. That means some sessions may end up being online. We're not sure yet. Um, either way, we need to show up. That's really important, okay? Um, but with COVID, in the shadow of COVID, we're in a brave new world, as I, as I say there, and we've got to have to be flexible in perhaps the way we um, progress through this course. 13 weeks, it's going to go like that. But, you know, so does COVID, so we don't really know. So um, read the course outline, of course. Mark the assessment dates in your calendar, please. Be planning, be thinking ahead, but also be thinking about what you would like to use as a case study to apply the historical thinking that we do uh, cover in the course to. Okay, so that's it. So this, in other words, if you're interested in Egyptian history, if you're in interested in the Vikings, if you're interested in ancient China or modern indigenous uh, history and relations, if you're interested in the history of an individual or a period or a place, or even on things like the history of food, the history of music and so on. These are all areas that you can actually say, okay, I'm going to actually start gathering some material on that because that's what I want to focus your attention on or my attention on, as we say. I'm looking forward to seeing you all across the semester. Whatever happens, you uh, need to know I'm determined that we will have fun with you all. So start exploring and remember that there is fun ahead and it's going to be up to you as to how much fun that ends up being. Thank you very much.